having partners come in and help clients decide, okay, where is this workload going to reside? How do I get the best spend and the best operating costs for this? And do I need all of that capacity? Maybe I need to put some in Azure and maybe I need to keep some on premise. There's so many different options. I think partners helping organizations get through that is a key function. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Incident Report presented by Quest Technology Management. I'm Paul Burke, Director of Technology Communications. Every week, I'm joined by VP of Sales and Partnerships, Adam Burke. The Incident Report brings you conversations with thought leaders, business innovators, and channel mavericks to help you stay productive and agile in a changing technology landscape. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Incident Report. This is episode 54. I'm Paul Burke. I'm half your host. Across from me, Adam Burke, my other co-host. Adam, how are you doing? Good, Paul. Excited to be here. Getting into spring, getting into Q2, getting into a little NBA basketball. I don't know for all the Kings fans out there that are enjoying a little 2-0 run going on against the Warriors. Not that I really follow basketball or care, but anytime a bandwagon organization can go 2-0 behind the Sacramento Kings, is, uh, it's a great thing. I'm 100% a bandwagon fan. I've been watching the last two games. I've become an expert in the last two games of basketball, like as if I understand anything that's going on. I'm not a huge basketball guy either, but always root for the Kings. And it's cool to see him, see him in the postseason right now, beating up on the Warriors a little bit. I'm sure that after I say this, they're going to completely tag and lose the next three in a row. But for now, it's, it's, a, fun, it's a fun day. We're going to find out how far they can make it. You were just at a partner summit last week. How was that? It was great. We had a good partner event, a technology service broker we work with brought in their top sales agents from about, about 20 in, in different fields. So they were, they brought in folks who sell a lot in security, folks who sell a lot in cloud infrastructure and people who sell a lot in unified communications and what's called CX. It was a lot of fun. Tim came out, Tim Burke, Gary Schick, our national partner manager was there. It was really nice to meet with the partners and the sales agents who are driving business, trying to figure out ways to put deals together, listening to their customers. We got awesome feedback as far as how they like to be trained, how they like to be exposed to new technologies. I think I got kicked under the table about 10 or 12 times from, from our CEO when a partner <laughs> would look at me and say, man, Adam, I had no idea you guys did that. Eventually I had to start, I had to start signaling to the partners like, Hey, hey, no, no, no. We, <laughs> your, your partner account team is fantastic and we're messaging to you guys are great, but it was good because there's, there's so many different ways that partners are trying to help their clients and that, that quest is, is trying to plug in and support them. It's just, it's that constant communication. And last week it was a great opportunity to, uh, opportunity to do that. I think you bring up a great point, staying in front of your partners, letting them know about new services, about new offerings, or the changes to current services. That has to be a lot of work to do. It is. And sometimes people, people joke about it, like being the, an anti-scale model. Like I think I had a partner say this to me last week. Well, well, yeah, every SLA can't be a snowflake. And it's like, well, no, that's true. It's not a snowflake, but at the same time, there's building blocks that go into how you're going to support an individual client and how they want to be supported. So it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a mind shift for some folks. Like a lot of people that we found in the channel, they have their skewed offerings, even large multi-million billion dollar type organizations, they have their SKUs and whatever the client's trying to do kind of has to fit into that, into that line item SKU. So it can flow through the billing and it can throw through, through receivables. It can flow through commissions. It's that SKU kind of mentality. We don't have that. We, we figure out that, Hey, this is, this is a service level agreement. Here's what they're trying to do. Here's how we can put it together. Let's work together and, and talk about it and, and, and put that together. So it's a little bit of a mind shift, a little bit mm. of a building block approach. It was a good, a good dialogue with those, with those folks. Getting somebody to embrace a mind shift sounds like code for, Hey, this is going to be a very challenging day. Well, and it's not wrong. It's not wrong to do skewed services and we have skewed services and it's not wrong to, to sell that way. It's what people have been doing for a long time and that's totally fine. I, Another thing I wanted to bring up, cause we got, we have channel partners coming up in May and that's mm -hmm. a big industry event for us where 
a lot of sales agents and partners from around the country. We all get together in Las Vegas and people learn about what's new. People learn about what's changing and people get to meet suppliers and we get to meet partners. It's funny, you, you kind of meet partners. Everyone's kind of in a different phase of their, their channel partner kind of story, if you will. We've been doing it for 13 years and at the partner event last week that I was at, it was, it was with, it was with Tolaris. They, they, these were all kind of their senior partners that have been doing it for a long time. So they were in a certain phase of their partner experience, selling service providers and acting as a broker and working with their end clients. I think there's, and I, I've, I've found about three different, three different phases that I could describe for a channel partner. The first one is they're brand new to the channel. Now I'm, I'm going to say a word, I don't mean it in a negative way, but they're a little bit naive to the way deals happen and the way things really work. And there's, I don't mean this in a negative way, but they're kind of doe eyed, wide open, like, wow, there's people spend trillions of dollars on security services and millions of dollars in product. And, and there's so much money and we're all going to be rich. We should call that the uh, Bambi phase. You're just wandering out in the wilderness. You're seeing yeah. the new things. Oh, there's flowers around. You're excited. Yeah. And, and people, people do what they say they're going to do and things work. And if it's on a slide, it's, it's really going to happen that way. I went through that phase when I first came on board. Everyone kind of goes through that phase. Now you stick along around long enough, you kind of move into the second phase, and that could be a little bit of could be a little bit jaded, right? You can lose a deal. You can sell something that the vendor says is going to work this way, doesn't really work that way. Mm -hmm. You could sell something to someone who tells you this is what we want to do, this is what we want to do, this is what we want to do, and then three weeks into the contract. They completely pull the rug out from under you and maybe go a different direction. Leadership changes, they cancel the contract, whatever. So you can go to that jaded kind of mindset. You can meet partners in a jaded mindset. Mm -hmm. You can tell where they're very closed off. Their very cards are being held close to the chest. They don't want to share a lot of information. They don't want to register an opportunity. They don't want to share details. They've been burned, right? So you find people sometimes in the, in that second phase of, of that journey. It could be rough and some people get stuck there. You can find people get stuck there. I would strongly, strongly convey as best you can. There's, there's fantastic opportunities in, in channel sales. There's fantastic opportunities in working with partners who want to work with you mm -hmm. and great growth potential across the board. We're in IT. We help people who have, who are, who are, who need help. And as long as you constantly kind of are helping people where they want to be served, you're, you're going to be a busy person. The, la the last phase of it, and this is where I really enjoyed the experienced operators that we met with last week. And you meet them, you meet them in all sorts of different relationships and TSBs, and there's great people on the channel all over. These are people who I, I would say they're, they're willing combatants. They know that they're looking at you across the table mm -hmm. and they know Jordan Peterson always talks about people are a bag of snakes. They know that that person across the table from them could do something nefarious, could be dishonest, could steal a deal from them, could, could do something bad. But they also know that that person across the table from them has the potential to help them serve their clients and deliver a positive outcome. You're willingly stepping into a relationship with someone that you know you can get burned. But unless you do step into that, you're not gonna be able to serve your clients. So I kind of call the third phase almost like a willing combatant. Someone who's been through the jaded phase, they realize, yeah, this person can completely burn me 100%. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm going to trust that my experience and we can come to a mutually beneficial agreement to work together and, and help deliver for our clients. So that's where a lot of these, the folks we were met with last week, they're running businesses, they're operating, they have experience, they, they built resumes, they've built books, they're trusted advisors, they're people who they're, their clients lean to and look to for, look to for help. Mm -hmm. Is every deal a slam dunk? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But they're willing, they're willing combatants. They're voluntarily stepping into a challenging position and something that could, it could hurt, but it can also help. So that's, that's a lot of fun when you find people that are willing to do that. And you got to constantly remind yourself that at least I do that. There are great people out there who really want to help their clients and move the ball forward in cybersecurity, move the ball forward in, in cloud and infrastructure, move the ball forward in, in communication services.
That's a really interesting three-phase process. It makes a lot of sense as I'm thinking about it. Do you find people get stuck in phases or they refuse to move out of a phase because they don't want to perceive um, like quote unquote reality? Do they get stuck in their phases? Well, well, some, some people, funny you say it, some people don't even make it to the second phase. Some people refuse to acknowledge the fact that Hey, that person you just introduced to like, you know, your client, they're doing some shady stuff over here and they're going to completely cut you out of that deal. You know that, right? And some people will, will stay in the Bambi phase and they refuse. They like, they almost refuse to see the shadow. Like they're like, no, 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 that, that can't happen. That'll never happen. Mm. It's like, it's happening right now. They don't want to see it. We've talked about this article before by Lieutenant Colonel Grossman, right? The, the sheepdog and the sheeps, the sheepdog and the sheep, right? The sheep don't want to necessarily see the sheepdog because it reminds them the wolf's out there. So if you want to stay in the Bambi phase of like, everything's fine, sunshine and rainbows, everyone's going to take care of me. We're all good. Okay. That's a method. And I'm not saying you need to be, I'm not saying you need to go into phase two wholeheartedly and be jaded and bitter. Mm -hmm. That's not helpful. That's not helpful or productive either. You got to find a little bit of a balance, I think, which is where you get to the phase three, which is where you're that willing combat. But yeah, you get people stuck in you get people stuck in the the willing voluntary naivete, if you will, or yeah. the or the everyone's out to get me. I gotta nuke the world, jaded type of situation. Hmm. We're going deep, Paul. We're going deep into some metaphysical stuff here. I love it. And and you ran into all three types of those people during the your partner summit. Well, I've been all three personally. I've been all three myself. And then you can recognize it when other people are kind of going through that in their own kind of channel partner and, and, and resell. Because a lot of people don't know you got to, in order to successfully deliver technology, you got to bring a lot of, you got to herd a lot of cats together. Mm -hmm. You got to get the, oh, you got to get the manufacturers on board. You got to get the software providers on board. You got to get the customer on board. Of course, first and foremost, like, are they actually going to buy from you? Then mm -hmm. you got to get your engineers to help you design it. You got to get your suppliers to help source it. You got to get your bank to give you the capital to actually, to actually put it all together. There are a ton of things that go into actually making this stuff at the end of the day, a deliverable. And there's a couple of different ways it can go sideways on you. So it's really important to, at least for me, and it was fun last week meeting with folks who voluntarily step into that. They know it's a challenge. They know it's hard work, but they have a mindset of, Let's go get this done. Let's go figure this out. Let's go work together and solve this problem. A lot yeah. of fun. A lot of fun. That's why I love, that's why I love being in the channel so much because you find great people like that. That's great. I'm glad it was so much fun. So you mentioned Channel Partners Conference and Expo that's coming up May 1st through the 4th. We're going to be there. Quest is going to be there. We got a booth. Come by. You can say hi to Adam and I. We're going to have the whole channel team there. So David Knoll from our partner support team. Gary Schick, National Partner Manager, Brian Perdue, National Named Account Manager for, for our named accounts. So we're going to have a lot of coverage there. If you, if you want to come up, we're going to be doing quick little training sessions throughout the day at our booth and also going to be participating in some, some of the after hour sponsorship opportunities there too. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to meeting people. What are you excited about at the conference? I'm, I'm kind of excited about hearing the, the different TSPs. There's a lot of consolidation going on. I'm kind of interested in seeing what their long-term plan is, what their individual strategies are. Some of them are going down the distribution lane. Some of them are going down the service provider lane. Some of them are going down, let's, let's get a lot of agencies and, and grow our book and help, help operate the back office for our, our partners, let them go sell. Really interested in hearing the stories. There's a lot, there's a lot of private equity coming into the channel. And it, it, a little trick I found is if you can, you can find the private equity guys, just look for the banking loafers. They have these, all the, all the private equity guys <laughs> wear these really nice, they wear these really nice, like, I think they're called banking loafers or something like that. Little, there's usually like a little metal clasp on it. There's no laces. You can spot them from a mile away. And I, I joke with the private equity guys all the time, but they all kind of, they all kind of wear the same uniform. You usually spot them away, a file away. If, if they're wearing, if they're wearing a Patagonia vest. That's also a, a dead giveaway too. So just, what, just keep an eye out. What about watches? Are they prone to wearing watches if we're trying to like spot them in the wilderness? <laughs> I've never, I've never noticed a specific watch type, but, but yeah, those loafers, those loafers are a dead giveaway. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch for those for sure. Got it. So scan, scan the floors, look for the loafers. 
and approach carefully. So, <laughs> yes, and and knowing your EBITDA. Yeah, and Paula, you're going to be there too, doing some. Uh, we got some candid. Uh, I know we're we'll going to be doing some live shots and some live interviews. So if you ever want to come up and and chat with Paul, I know he's going to be mic'd up and ready to rock. We're doing it. We're bringing the equipment. I got mics. I got cameras. It'll be a lot of fun. Very cool. There's so many things happening. We're talking about so many things. We're talking about partner summits. We're talking about expos in Vegas. And Adam, you highlighted a couple articles on channelfutures.com you wanted to talk about. I'm really glad we're taking an opportunity to share with everybody listening. And if you would like to read the article yourself, the link will be in the description of the podcast. So first article, customers need partners to help navigate the new digital ecosystem. What jumped out in this article for you, Adam? Well, I, I like the way that they kind of acknowledge the fact that data is residing in multiple places. There are multiple SaaS providers. Clients are consuming subscription services. They're going through, apologize for the marketing buzz term here, digital transformation of different aspects of their business. And what partners are helping people do is identify, okay, where is your data reside? Where are your users residing? where your customers are residing and how do we actually tie these things together? So a lot of people don't realize, but you have your assets potentially in an Azure environment or in an AWS environment. You can also have your SaaS applications that can tie directly into those, that platform through APIs in those same data centers. So you got providers like Equinix and digital realty and data centers all over the country. We use them and organizations like that as our our data center and delivery center platforms, but, and so do a lot of other SaaS providers. So there's so many different diverse applications, having partners come in and help clients decide, okay, where is this workload going to reside? How do I get the best, how do I get the best spend and the best operating costs for this? And do I need all of that capacity? Maybe, maybe I need to put some in Azure and maybe I need to keep some on premise or similar to their communications. There's so many different options. I think partners helping organizations get through that is a key function. And unpopular opinion, but I don't know if you've been noticing, there's been some, a lot of interviews with Elon Musk recently, mm -hmm. and he's talking a lot about AI. And I think partners need to be very, very careful with the idea of, hey, I'm going to I'm going to be the person to generate answers for you and, and bring in three or four or five or six or 10 or whatever potential providers for you. Because if you think about it, I was just thinking about this actually this morning, what happens when someone creates an application that allows an end user to enter their information into an AI system saying, Hey, I have 20 sites. I have hundred meg connection at each one of these sites, one data center where I host these 10 applications. What's the best XYZ edge SASE or next generation firewall mm. based on this budget enter. And then chat GPT or whatever the application comes back with, here's your good, here's your better, here's your best option. And then that, I mean, that's some real disruption that could happen in the, in the consulting agency. And I think Partners need to be very, very cautious of how are you, how are you helping your clients make decisions? Because we've seen disintermediation before. I always laugh when, when partners talk about their AWS practice, when AWS was literally built on destroying the middleman. I mean, it literally was built on disintermediation. That's swinging back right now. The hyperscalers and the cloud environments, people are realizing, hey, I'm not quite sure that's delivering all the savings that we thought it was based on utilization. They're evaluating that. But I think at the same time, partners need to be really, really cautious of how are you relevant to your customers in that consulting aspect or in that, if you're providing, here's the five people that can help you mm -hmm. and that's, that's your value. I think you're, you're in a, you're in a very dangerous position because that can be disintermediated very, very quickly. And I think we're going to see, I'm, I'm curious to see who who develops that first. I know the big TSBs are all investing a lot in automation. I know they're all investing a lot in, hey, plug in this data and get this output. That's a big arms race going on right now. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see who who's the first person to integrate like a chat GPT 
type of a service that allows you to enter your customer information and, and it, it, it spits out based on the, the, the summary of knowledge on the internet, which is basically what Shappy GPT does is it, it summarizes all known information and then generates a response from that. Wow. That's fascinating. I, I hadn't thought about that, but that will be interesting to see who gets there first. And it might not happen. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, there's, there's, there's costs of, there's costs of consulting. There's, there's relationships. People like to buy from people. I can hear all the arguments from people throwing tomatoes at me right now from the, from the audience, as far as like, boo, that's not going to happen, but it could, and it's probably good to think about it a little bit. Yeah. At least throw it out there as a possibility. Just so when, if, if it does happen that you're not, you're just aware of the possibility. Yeah. Be aware of it. And, 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 and I'd say maintain, trying to maintain relevance with your customers beyond a simple search and pick list. Like we all used, you and I used to go to, remember Walden books yes. and Barnes and Noble and all these bookstores. We used to go hang out there and, and, and read or whatever. Um, I was just out. watching, I was watching Seinfeld last night and they mentioned Jay Peterman was signing books at Walden. And I was like, oh, I remember those days. Yeah. Well, Amazon destroyed the retailer, mm -hmm. right? So they destroyed that bookstore, right? You didn't need to, you could just buy books, you could tri drop ship them if you didn't need that. Mm -hmm. So we've all, we've all seen that. It was hilarious the other day. I was in, I think I was in Kierland in Scottsdale and I was walking and I saw AWS bookstore, which I thought was just the irony of that was <laughs> beyond the pale, but they basically destroyed that, that retail and they basically kind of cr crushed the middleman who was helping get the publisher's work to the end user. So, and they, they kind of do that, that same thing in the, in the cloud space, they go to these massive data centers. And they have these massive, amazing capabilities. They're fantastic. And applications of app, app developers love it. It was like that. I don't know. There's a great Microsoft speech for that. Uh, the guy who owns the guy who owns the Clippers, not, not Gates, but the other dude. Balmer. Yeah. Balmer. Google developers, developers, developers speech sometime. It's, it's great. And it, it, AWS took that to heart too. They built their environment to really cater to DevOps and developers. Well. There's a lot of people that used to be in that supply chain that would help people, help people procure the appropriate servers. They'd help them rack the servers. They'd help them source the data center. They'd host the data center. They do the configuration, the management, basically deliver the platform. Mm -hmm. All of that, that all got scraped away, right? So you had a bunch of people had to figure, re refigure out their business plans in order to stay alive. But when a lot of people shifted their spend to AWS, mm. that's been happening for 12, 15 years now. Okay. Perfect. That makes more sense. Thank you very much. And that is a perfect segue into the second article you wanted to talk about, which is also from Channel Futures, and it's about the public cloud. Public cloud spending jumps 22% in 2023, driven by AWS, Azure, and Google. And Adam, here's my confusion. This article says cloud spending jumps 22%, but other reports say cloud spending is down. So I'm a little confused on the reporting. Well, they, they kind of buried the lead a little bit. So, so yes, it is, it is jumping 22%, but the, the investor class and the people who were dealing with these projections were expecting 30% and they, and they build out their models, their profitability and those things based on those, that, that, those, the, the ramp and that growth. And so when that misses by 8%, it's like, oh, well, you know, they're still growing at 22%. Yeah, that's true. But most of our economy and most of our companies are built on kind of that marginal thought, mm -hmm. right? So one to 2%, 5% versus a projection, the companies are built to operate at that projected growth rate, right? So if you miss that by 8%, that's a significant amount of money being removed, right? The uncomfortable conversation that no one really likes to have is labor is typically the largest cost. For mm -hmm. most of these, these companies, there's a guy, I think it's called meet Kevin or, or Kevin or something like that. I'll, we'll, we'll add the link in here, but he, he had a great point the other day. I was watching a video on him. Google has about 170 people trying to figure out how to best incorporate artificial intelligence into their search and Google 60 per 65% of their revenue is made up from their search and ad revenue. 
So they have a hundred, they have like 150 to 160 people working on something that generates 65% of their revenue. So it's like 0.08% of their actual labor force. Are you serious? Very small. That's yeah, it? it's very, it's very small. So that's incredible. They're, right. Right. So, so, so think that through. So, so think into the next step. We have a hundred, you know, less than 200 people working on something that gener generates 65% of the revenue. They employ thousands of people. That blows my mind. I had no yeah. idea it was so small. Yeah. So there could be some changes coming up potentially. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. But I think when you start seeing, when you start seeing people miss on the, the top line projections, and then you see people kind of re-evaluating where they're spending their money, that 8% miss in public cloud spend and what was forecasted for 2022, that's going to have some ramifications down the line. There's, there are going to be decisions made by the people calling the shots from the investor class and from the people within the organization who are making these decisions based on forecasts. It's going to shake out. It'll be interesting. I, I have no idea what's going to happen, mm -hmm. but it was definitely a miss and that's not really being talked about too much. It sounds like a lot of PR spin where it's like, well, we're up 22%. That's a win. Yeah. And, and that's great. I mean, that's, that's, that's fantastic growth, but it's cooling off and, and, we're, and, and people are trying to figure out, you know, us, you know, anecdotally, we're, we're seeing organizations move some of their, some of their cloud spend into different, different zones, different on-premise edge compute, figuring out different ways to be a little bit more predictable. Mm -hmm. in their cost models. And that's, that's happening. That's happening everywhere. It's not going away. The, the hyperscalers are the hyperscalers. They're the, they're the big dogs on the street. They're going to grow. They're going to be there. Um, but they're, they all kind of, they got their piece of the pie. They're, they're duking it out. Azure took a bunch of Google, or excuse me, of AWS, Microsoft with their chat GPT integration into Bing is incrementally attacking Google's search revenue. So they're all kind of figuring out their strategies. And I don't think, I don't think hiring more people is part of that. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of the phrase like skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck is, because it feels like a lot of the projections were like 30% and they thought that's where the puck was. And then it, it's eight percentage points off. Someone always says like the stock market and the market does whatever makes the, the most people look foolish. Mm -hmm. If you're always with the consensus, it's okay. You can, you can hang around after the crash and drink beers together and reminisce about how you're all wrong, or you could ask some questions and just maybe be a little bit more cautious before you kind of go along with the consensus view. And if you don't like asking questions, you can just listen to the podcast. Adam's going to have plenty of questions every week that are going to make you think, and I appreciate it. It gives me things to consider about the channel. And speaking about the channel, Adam, what are you looking forward to this week? We got two weeks out from Channel Partners. Super excited about that. Really looking forward to the meeting partners there. And yeah, just continuing to talk about capabilities and helping folks out. We had a security awareness go out yesterday from some some bad IPs that some the FBI kind of let us know. Hey, these these IPs are coming in from bad actors, and we sent that out to our partners and to our community. And people came back like, Hey, is this legit? Like, why are you sending this to me? I'm like, Well, it's there's no reason to keep information like this to ourselves. If there's bad actors that are coming in from these known IP addresses, here's some, here's some stuff, maybe go help your clients block these or, or get these added to a, a list of, of potential bad actors for your environment. So I think it's, like you said, it's always changing. We're here to help when we're, we're excited about talking to as many people as we can about different areas where we can, where we can be of service. That's great. Adam, have an amazing week. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing your insights and everybody listening. We'll see you next week. Thanks everyone. Have a great week. And quick reminder, we will be at the Channel Partner Conference and Expo May 1st through the 4th in Las Vegas. Say hello to myself. Say hello to Adam, the rest of the Quest team. You can find us at booth 1902 at the Channel Partner Expo and Conference May 1st through the 4th. Thanks so much for listening. The Incident Report is brought to you by Quest Technology Management. With over 40 years of experience, Quest is a leading technology integrator working seamlessly with your staff and systems to achieve your IT goals. Learn more about everything they do at questsys.com. And if you have questions or suggestions for the podcast, you can always email Adam and myself at the Incident Report 
at questus.com. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.